Welcome to the Rotary Club of Tucson and our first virtual meeting during this coronavirus crisis. We are living in a totally different world from just three to four weeks ago. No St. Patrick's Day, no U of A sports, and all of our hearts just ache that our very own Rotary Club of Tucson honorary member Adia Barnes was not able to take Ari McDonald and her inspiring women to play a couple of games at a sold out McHale Center and make a deep run in the NCAA tourney. That would have been an amazing memory for the Tucson community. Oh well, no Masters, no Kentucky Derby, no baseball. And on top of that, no movie theaters, no bars, no restaurants, no gym workouts. Well, looking at me, I guess I'm okay with no gym workouts. All of this happens during a span of a couple of weeks. It's truly mind boggling. But what do we have? We have us. We have a family of Rotarians who care about each other and care about this community. This is a trying time and we will work through it as a club. I hope you will enjoy today's virtual meeting. We have a fantastic keynote speaker in Amanda Powers, CEO of FC Tucson, our local soccer team. We have a few birthdays, like we always do, some inspirational videos that I know many of you enjoy, and some feel-good messages from a few of our members. After all, isn't that what we are looking for right now? Some good news and some feel-good stories. So today, sit back and enjoy and take a break from the craziness for the next 45 minutes or so. Relax and enjoy. We are the Rotary Club of Tucson. Well, we'd love to have somebody come up to the microphone and the video to do our pledge, but in my typical format, I found a wonderful video for the Pledge of Allegiance today. So if you're at home watching, go ahead and stand up. You will enjoy this. It's a two and a half year old reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to her dad, who is stationed in Afghanistan. Hi. Hi. What's your name? My name is Alexa. And how old are you? It's just old go be my birthday. When, when it's your birthday, how old are you gonna be? Three. When is your birthday? In August. It's in August. In August second. Ooh. And what, what, what does your daddy do? In Afghanistan. Daddy's in Afghanistan? Yes. Is, what does he do? Is he a... A soldier. A soldier. A soldier. Yeah. Are we making a video for him? Yeah. Can you say the pledge? Pledge of allegiance to the flag, nation, state of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, to the river for with royalty and justice for all. Can you tell Daddy you love him? I love you, Daddy, so much. Say bye-bye. Bye-bye. And now for our patriotic song. Again, we're, we're kind of moving away from God Bless America and some of our typical songs. And in light of what's going on in America, I really thought you might enjoy Johnny Cash, This Ragged Old Flag. I believe this was a Super Bowl commercial, so enjoy. I walked through a county courthouse square on a park bench, an old man was sitting there. I said, your old courthouse is kind of run down. He said, no, it'll do for our little town. I said, your old flagpole has leaned a little bit, and that's a ragged old flag you got hanging on it. He said, have a seat, and I sat down. Is this the first time you've been to our little town? 
I said, I think it is. He said, I don't like to brag, but we're kind of proud of that ragged old flag. You see, we got a little hole in that flag there when Washington took it across the Delaware. And it got powder burned the night that Francis Scott Key said, watching it right and say, can you see? And it got a bad rip in New Orleans, Packingham and Jackson tugging at its seam. And it almost fell at the Alamo beside the Texas flag, but she waved on though. She got cut with a sword at Chancellorsville, and she got cut again at Shiloh Hill. There was Robert E. Lee, Beauregard, and Bragg, and the south wind blew hard on that ragged old flag. On Flanders Field in World War I, she got a big hole from a Bertha gun. She turned blood red in World War II. She hung limp and low a time or two. She was in Korea, Vietnam. She went where she was sent by her Uncle Sam. She waved from our ships upon the briny foam, and now they've about quit waving back here at home. In her own good land here, she's been abused. She's been burned, dishonored, denied, and refused. And the government for which she stands is scandalized throughout the land. And she's getting threadbare and she's wearing thin, but she's in good shape for the shape she's in. Cause she's been through the fire before. And I believe she can take a whole lot more. So we raise her up every morning. We take her down every night. We don't let her touch the ground and we fold her up right. On second thought, I do like to brag cause I'm mighty proud of that ragged old flag. Our rotary inspiration today is about overcoming adversity, something we're all dealing with in our own different ways. And today's video is called Never Say Can't. And this is about a gymnast, a champion gymnast in fact, without legs. We are dealing with some adversity right now, but in light of this inspirational moment, I think it will put things in perspective and help us all understand how lucky we are to have our health and our families enjoy. Can't is not part of your vocabulary. If you just put your mind to it, you can do it. And you believe that? Yeah, that, that's the crazy thing is if you're never given limits, then you think, I can do anything. And if she could do anything, she wanted it to be this. What she saw her hero, Dominique Mociano, doing on TV. There was just one problem. Jennifer was born without legs, a devastating birth defect that had led her natural parents to abandon her the day she was born. It bothered me to think that there was a little girl that was left at the hospital and she had no legs, so I thought she needed a family that would love her and take care of her. Sharon and her husband, Gerald, brought her home to the tiny town of Hardinville, Illinois. Population 50, they say, if you count the dogs and cats. They decided to raise her like they raised their three healthy sons, with no limitations and just one simple rule. Never say the word. Can't. You said, I want to be a tumbler. <laughs> you didn't have legs. Right. You kind of need those, most people think, to, to tumble. <laughs> well. Think again. The girl who wasn't allowed to say can't was on her way to becoming a genuine gymnastics champion. She started at seven on the trampoline with her dad. And after a few falls, she got the hang of it. In time, she was competing. 
and soon after that, she was dominating. And by high school, Jennifer Bricker, are you ready for this, was the tumbling champion of the state of Illinois. Soon, Jennifer was pursuing other sports too. Even one, you'd figure, she had absolutely no chance to play well. Until it turned out, she could steal the ball, even grab a few rebounds. And she could make baskets, too. She didn't consider herself handicapped. She was talking to some friends one time, and uh, one of them said something about her being handicapped. She said, well, I'm not handicapped. And they said, well, you have to use a wheelchair. She said, just to keep them getting dirty. <laughs> one day at age 16, out of curiosity, Jennifer asked her mother a question. Hey, is there anything that you, like, know about my adoption or biological family that you didn't tell me? I said, OK, but you got to sit down. And she said, Mom, I'm always sitting. And she said, maybe you should sit down. I said, OK, let me sit down. And she said, well, what's the big deal? Just tell me what my last name is. And I said, well, that's the big deal. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, your last name would have been Mochianu. I knew what that meant. I knew that Dominique Mochianu was my biological sister. When she finally tracked Dominique down, Jennifer wrote her a letter. Inside the envelope were adoption papers, a photograph, and a stunning piece of news. My biological last name is Mochianu. That, that line, I, I was just like, I can't believe this is happening. Everything was there. The evidence was there. Jennifer looked like the spitting image of my youngest sister, Christina. What a moment to for anyone to even speak to their childhood idol, but for their childhood idol to be their sister, that's something. She told me she was an athlete in the letter. In fact, I was her inspiration to start tumbling and doing gymnastics. And then on the phone call, she goes, oh, by the way, I have no legs. I mean, she's like, wait a minute, didn't you just tell me that you're an acrobat and you did all these <laughs> sports and I could just hear the wheels turning and, you know? Yeah. And I said, who is this girl? Oh my gosh. How did she have this attitude to persevere in life and overcome every obstacle? And she's my sister. Jennifer has moved out to Hollywood. Where else if you want to be a star? She drives a specially equipped car and lives a normal, independent life. And she's earning a living. How else? As a gymnast. She's an acrobat who has toured with Britney Spears. And now she's training for a classical performance at New York's Lincoln Center. We got to go to Ohio and got to watch her perform. The audience just went crazy. They stood up and they were whistling and screaming and clapping and, and all this, and I was blubbering. <laughs> I was sobbing because it was so beautiful. And it's like, oh my goodness, that's my baby. The baby who was taught early on never to say the word can't. And Rotarians, uh, introducing our guests and visiting Rotarians, our famous and friendly Scott Vaughn. He's been a member since 1985, 35 years in the Rotary Club of Tucson. He was a past president in 2009-2010, been married for 54 years to Margie, was on the American Bandstand with Dick Clark, if you can believe it. So ladies and gentlemen, fellow Rotarians, please welcome Scott Vaughn. Thanks, Bob, and thanks for trying to hold me to 30 seconds. Let's begin with the visiting Rotarians. Watching us from Long Beach is president of the Long Beach Rotary Club, Molly Beck. Hello, Molly. Hi, Molly. And the president of the San Diego Rotary Club is with us. Welcome, David Oates. Hello, Hi, David. David. And also joining us is president of the Los Angeles LA5 Rotary Club, Rick Gibson. Hi, Rick. So the California Rotary leadership we all thank you for joining us, and we wish your members to be safe and in good health. So now we welcome these guests to our club. We are virtually thrilled to have you join us. And when I call your name, please stand up so we can see what you're wearing. Drew Vactor has a guest, Larry Potter. Hi, Larry. And Bob Schaff has brought a guest, the lovely Linda Schaff. Hi, Linda. Hi, Linda. Jay Gandolfi has a guest who's processing as a new member, Phil Malin. Hey, Bill. And I have some familiar guests joining us from Phoenix. Pauline Heckler. Hi, Pauline. And Jean Heckler. And happy, and happy birthday, Pauline. We miss you. 
And finally, we welcome another former member, Chrissy Amon Perrin. Hi, Hi Chrissy. Chrissy. When Chrissy was here, she was Community Relations Director with the Tucson Padres. She says she's thrilled to be with us today and see some familiar faces. Before that, she was a star at the U of A and brought home Olympic gold. Chrissy and her amazing family are checking in from South Lake, Texas. So welcome and welcome back to the Rotary Club of Tucson. And before I leave you, I just want to give another shout out to Rick Rose and his crew here at Film Creations. Without you, we just couldn't have this meeting. We're really thrilled with your participation and cooperation. And now it's time for our program. And as Rick Rose and Film Creations has done in the past, we have another video introduction narrated by local marketing expert, Matt Russell. Please direct your attention to the screen. Amanda Powers is no stranger to competitive sports. An NCAA All-American swimmer and former Chief Operating Officer of New Mexico United, Amanda was integral to the development of New Mexico's first statewide professional sports franchise. Amanda has a degree in international business from Sonoma State University and a project management certificate from the University of New Mexico. Amanda's economic feasibility and site study for a downtown Albuquerque soccer stadium helped entice local investors to invest $8 million in the United brand. And within one year, record-breaking crowds signaled that the United phenomenon was there to stay. Powers arrived in Tucson following a consultancy with several new and existing franchises in the USL, but her record of championing strategic business development efforts spans more than 15 years. Amanda is passionate about volunteerism and has mentored dozens of incarcerated teenage girls. She's married to a Los Alamos native, Malcolm, and they will be making a new home here in Tucson with their dogs, cats, and two goats. Let's have a warm rotary welcome for Amanda Powers from FC Tucson. I want to thank Mark Irvin for inviting me to present this inaugural digital speaking engagement for the Tucson Rotary Club. I recently moved to Tucson and met Mark within the first few weeks of moving here. I could tell right off the bat, Mark and I were of the same tribe. Mark has a vision for this city, and so do I. Amid all the challenges we are facing in this moment, I do believe we have a tremendous opportunity to raise up as leaders, live by our words, and maintain the commitments to the community as much as we can. I arrived to Tucson by way of Albuquerque on January 1st of this year with the opportunity of a lifetime to be the president of a professional soccer team. I had the privilege of co-founding a professional soccer team in 2018, New Mexico United, and went on as the COO to launch the club for its inaugural year in 2019. We worked tirelessly for nine months to build a grassroots movement around a mission that not just soccer fans could understand, but all citizens. Day in, day out, we showed up for the public, hosting events, tabling every chance we could, and consistently supporting the youth in the hope that we could bring something that could awe and inspire for a lifetime. Come the season opener, we had sellout crowds of 13,000 plus, and went on to create a movement of supporters, fans, organizers, politicians, and business leaders who could connect in ways they never had before, and that was through the beautiful game. What we did for New Mexico was like catching lightning in a bottle, but it didn't come easy or quick. I first came into soccer in 2015 when I was approached by a local entrepreneur to help him with his vision to bring pro soccer to New Mexico. This entrepreneur had the passion and I had the acumen, and together we were able to form an advisory council of community influencers who would not only help us to attract more than $10 million of investment towards the purchase of a professional soccer franchise, but help pave a way to create 30 full-time jobs and an opportunity for young talent to show off their skills on a global platform that ultimately created a buzz that sponsors, partners, and community organizations could rally behind. Thanks to that entrepreneur's vision and our efforts, Albuquerque now has a plan in place for a downtown stadium that could be a real game changer for the area and for hospitality, tourism, and even the entrepreneurial ecosystem. This season, Fuerza Tucson is our slogan. And now, more than ever, we need Fuerza Tucson, Tucson strong. When I first began working in soccer, a diehard Liverpool FC fan told me the story about British and German soldiers pausing during World War I to play a match of footy. At first, I couldn't believe it. 
But once I learned more, I knew soccer truly was a platform for social change. For more than 100 years, soccer has been in the trenches. In 1914, during World War I, several impromptu soccer matches were played between British and German soldiers in no man's land on Christmas Day. For one day, the enemies made a spontaneous peace. As the story goes, a German high command, hoping to boost morale, sent thousands of little Christmas trees to the trenches. The aim was to keep the soldiers' hearts in the battle. Instead, it had the opposite effect. Christmas highlighted similarities between Christian nations in opposite trenches. When German soldiers at La Chapelle des Armentres in France sang the carol, Silent Night, a British regiment shouted for more. Near the French village, Flibro, British soldiers in their trenches saw Christmas trees hung with lights advancing into no man's land. The Germans were making a seasonal gesture. The Brits responded. After that, everywhere, enemies shook hands, wished each other Merry Christmas, and arranged not to shoot the next day. Together, they fantasized about the war dissolving in a burst of brotherhood. How do men, without a common language, express friendship? They play soccer. Now, the games weren't serious. One lasted only an hour, after which both teams were exhausted. And though corpses had been cleared from the battlefield, Earlier that day, shell holes and the soldiers' huge boots made close control impossible. Players who fell in the mud were pulled out by the enemy to cheers from spectators perched on the parapets. Goalposts were either a couple of pieces of wood or caps or helmets. I believe soccer is the common language that can unite us together and is now that we can prove how that's done. The mission of FC Tucson is to serve as a platform that honors our heritage while creating a sense of camaraderie and inspiration under one unifying symbol that all of Tucson can take pride in. 10 years ago, FC Tucson was founded by a local group of dedicated Tucsonans who wanted to elevate the sport and bring professional soccer to the city of Tucson. Since that time, FC Tucson has been responsible for helping to put Tucson on the national stage by hosting the annual MLS preseason training events, as well as developing America's top players who have gone on to become U.S. men's national team and MLS members. But FC Tucson is more than soccer. FC Tucson is a platform that promotes a spirit of camaraderie, inspiration, and hope. In this new decade, FC Tucson intends to stand by that mission and carry it out in all that we do. Many of you might be familiar with the annual MLS preseason event held at Kino Sports Complex every January through February. In partnership with Visit Tucson, we have attracted a dozen MLS teams to Tucson who hold their two to four week preseason training here. Each year, the preseason event brings in more than $2 million of economic spending in the local area. The MLS teams book nearly 3,000 to 5,000 hotel room nights between their teams and traveling fans. Additionally, while in market, we pulled out the red carpet and try to show off all the finest tourist attractions and treasures of Tucson. FC Tucson hosts match plays between the teams and crowns a Visit Tucson Cup champion. This is a tremendous opportunity for the youth to see their soccer heroes play and elevate their imagination to all new levels of possibility. For eight years, FC Tucson was a semi-professional team that garnered a winning reputation. FC Tucson dominated the Premier Development League with more than 60 wins. In 2019, the team was promoted to the professional third division of soccer, USL League One. This created whole new opportunities for FC Tucson to serve as a true path to pro for the local youth teams. The three components of everything we do are players, the community, and entertainment. Our players are professional athletes that sign contracts and wear the FC Tucson club crest as a badge of honor. These players have a universal understanding of what soccer means to them and their community. We have seven international players and welcome trialists from as far as Japan to Spain. Our players are carrying out the dreams of their childhood to play soccer professionally. And our hope is that a child in our audience makes that their dream too. We are building a community patchwork of partners that include sponsors like Chapman Automotive, Vantage West, Body Central, and The Playground. We're also dedicated to rallying for the youth, and not just soccer, but all the youth by working with Tucson Unified School Districts, Vail Soccer Club, and many, many more. We have a tremendous supporters group who create chants, make TIFO art paintings for every match, bring the regalia and fandom that are the magic ingredients to making soccer, making a soccer match so unique. 
Then there's the entertainment aspect. One could say that we're just putting a soccer game together, but we believe it's so much more. Each match will be curated from the moment you drive up to Kino Sports Complex to the second you walk through the gates to post-match fireworks. We want every single person who attends an FC Tucson match to walk away saying, I'll be back, or wow, I've never experienced anything like that before. I want more. Professional soccer at the USL League One and championship level are changing communities across the United States. I've seen this for myself in Albuquerque as well as other cities like Tulsa, Madison, Wisconsin, and El Paso, Texas. U.S. soccer is overseen by the United States Soccer Federation and is responsible for the organizational structure and pathways to take young, developing talent at the recreation level and advance them to the highest levels of professional soccer in the hope to form the best U.S. men's and women's national team. The U.S. women's national team is clearly in its own category of greatness. And that's in part because girls and women have been exposed to the sport since a young age, going back to the 1970s. However, the U.S. men's national team has struggled over the years in qualifying for top match play, including the 2020 FIFA World Cup. Right now, the U.S. is competing for a spot to qualify for the 2020 Olympics, whereas the women's team is already qualified. For the U.S. to compete at the top levels of soccer in the world, it's got to start with developing the youth and providing a path to professional play. I often say, if you say you're a patriotic American, then you need to care about FC Tucson. Soccer is no longer a sport on the fringes. It's everywhere, but we still have a ways to catch up with the rest of the world's competition. It's our goal at FC Tucson to extend our recruiting efforts to every corner and stretch of Southern Arizona to find the next young, talented player who deserves that path to professional play. We've been so excited and working so hard for these past three months to bring you a refreshed, winning team this season, only to be stopped in our tracks with the pandemic. While our season is currently on pause, we are not. As the inaugural president of FC Tucson and the second U.S. woman ever residing over a men's professional soccer team, I feel a sense of duty, honor, and pleasure to carry out the mission of FC Tucson. I left my friends, family, business, and community of 12 years behind in New Mexico for this city because I know what soccer can do for Tucson and believe we can build something big and bold here. And now, even with plans potentially delayed, we will not stop our commitment to building a community asset that it can transform the social fabric and economic climate of Tucson. Here's how we intend to do it. First of all, Tucson is an ideal city for sports, especially soccer. With all the year-round sunshine, the amazing University of Arizona Athletics Department, and the fandom that backs those teams, I have no doubt in my mind that we can draw tens of thousands of fans per match. One of the things that makes Tucson ideal for professional soccer is that this is already a sports town. With the University of Arizona, the women's soccer team, the Pima County Community College's tremendous men's soccer program, the Roadrunners, the Sugar Skulls, this is a true sports town. Now what's missing is a pro soccer team that the whole community can rally behind. Third, our facilities. The Kino Sports Complex is a wonderful training facility and quite frankly, it's world class. We train 283 days of the year there and play before a grandstand that can host up to 4,000 fans. We believe that we can easily sell 4,000 tickets a game this year. The other thing that makes Tucson so special and ripe for pro sports is the vibrant downtown, arts, food, and music scene. When I walk around 4th Avenue, Congress Street, there's an energy. There's something special that's happening in Tucson, and we think that sports can really complement everything else that's happening downtown. Lastly, a few years from now, we intend to promote ourselves to the next level of pro soccer, the championship level. In order to do that, we're gonna need to to build a, mobilize a fan base, build supporters, and encourage people to come out to every single one of our 14 home games and rep that crest. Besides economic impact, sports serve, a very important component of the economy that I don't think we talk much about is, is hope. How do you measure the economic impact of hope? We think we do, and we feel it every day with the lives we interact with and, sense, and that sense of enthusiasm SC Tucson brings to the community. We would love to hear how you would measure the economic impact of hope by leaving a comment below 
or following us on any of our social media platforms. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with you all today, especially during these times where we really need to be Tucson strong. Amanda Powers, thank you very much for that amazing and inspiring keynote talk. Uh, one of the things we do at Rotary is we support literacy. We have a car show, we raise about $200,000 a year, and for many years we've been supporting Make Way for Books. And so what we have is a, a gift for your talk to our club is a book that we'd like you to sign on the inside. And we found a book that we think is appropriate today. Bears Can't Play Soccer. So thank you very much for visiting the Rotary Club of Tucson. Can we do a little business now, if you don't mind? It'll take uh, 10 minutes or so. And one of the things we do in Rotary is we recognize our birthday people. And we have three birthdays today. The first up is Dot Kret. She's been a member since 2003. Her birthday was on March the 21st. Her business is community and social services. She owns P DK Advocates and Pac Mail, and she was the Tucson Woman of the Year in 2003. Please welcome Dot Kret. Happy birthday, Dot. Thank you, President Bob. Yo! Yo! Can't hear you. Yo! Yo! Hey! Hey! We're celebrating my birthday. Ron Oxman was my sponsor, taught me the rotary way. Gib Raymond was my mentor taught me how to play. This club is so remarkable, the best of the lot. I really appreciate the lessons you've taught. Eradicating polio is a battle that we fought, and I'm always educated by the speakers we've got. We give scholarships to kids to help them improve their thought. Car show and special projects, we're doing what we ought. And we have all contributed by the tickets that we've bought. And by not having meetings, there's viruses we've not got. An amazing club with lifelong friendships. Thank you all for laughing at my jokes and at my quips. The Rotary Round Table's full of good advice and tips, and thanks for your support of my pac -Mail store for the cool stuff that you ship. Thanks, too, from Archive Advantage for the images that we've scanned. And when these hard times happen, it's great that you all understand that sometimes life can take us down a path we haven't planned. But we're here for each other, and that's what makes this club so grand. I really miss the meetings. I miss all of you mugs. And I really miss the fellowship, and I really miss the hugs. It's horrible what's happening, and at my heart it tugs because of this pandemic, because of these damn bugs. No touching social distance makes me feel like such a weenie. And no social interaction for all of us makes us feel mean E. So don't go driving all around town in your Lamborghini. Stay home, stay safe, and enjoy your quarantine. Thank you, Dot. I have a present for you for your birthday, so I hope you enjoy this because it's really appropriate for today. Happy birthday. Well, thank you, Bob. You gotta show them what it is, though. This is the best present ever. Yes, here we go. Happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. And second up, we have our very own Ellie Patterson. She's been a member since 2010. Her birthday was on March 17th. And that was St. Patrick's Day. This week, nobody showed up, but oh well. She's the owner and um, founder of Temp Connection, recently retired. She was a past president of this club in 2016 and 2017. And most importantly, she is our current district governor. She's an avid hiker, cyclist, and a pilot. She loves elephants and is a green belt in karate. So she's got the full gamut. Please welcome Ellie Patterson. Happy birthday, Ellie. Well, thanks, President Bob. I always enjoy my birthday on St. Patrick's Day. It is one of the most fun holidays that we have, and it was this past Tuesday. I hope you enjoyed your St. Pat's as well. We had a bit of trouble finding the Irish pub this year, but at least we kept our distance and maintained a safe place in the backyard while enjoying a cool one. I'd like to take this moment to thank my friend and sponsor, Mike Schulte, for bringing me into this wonderful club, or in Bob Schaff's words, our remarkable club. I'd also like to fa thank my friend and mentor, Doc Kret, who is also celebrating her birthday this month. 
I'm giving a check to the Rotary Foundation, which does so much good around the world, like helping mothers and children keep healthy with health screenings, providing clean drinking water, finishing the job of eradicating polio worldwide, and funding small organizations so businesses can be created. That's just a few things the Rotary Foundation can do. So, as a St. Pat's birthday child, I'm sending you my Irish blessing, and here we go. May your days be many and your troubles be few, and may all the blessings descend upon you. May peace be within you, and may your heart be strong, and may you find what you're seeking wherever you roam. But please don't roam too far these days. In fact, save your roaming until later, and always practice social distancing. Thank you. Happy St. Pat's Day, belatedly. John Wong, one of our longtime members, member since 1983, 37 years in our club. His birthday was on March the 15th. He's also a past president, 2007, 2008. He was a U of A team doctor for I don't know how long, probably 40 years. He actually did one of his final surgeries on my ankle, believe it or not. He was a Green Beret in Vietnam and he won the highest award in our Rotary Club, the Orville McPherson Award in 2011. Please welcome John Wong. Happy birthday, John. Thank you, President Bob. I uh, have uh, three things I'd like to say, and being a past president, you told me I could speak for 48 minutes, so here we go. First, uh, I'd like to make the obligatory thank you uh, for my sponsor, Charlie O'Dowd, back in 1983, brought me into this wonderful organization. And uh, very shortly thereafter, he was forced to resign. Next message. Um, I want to say this to all our members, but especially to those who are more recently included uh, in this uh, extraordinary club. Uh, and that is that uh, when I came in, uh, my first objective was to uh, be in an oasis in the middle of the week, away from doctors and nurses and patients for at least an hour every day. My second was, as probably the case with many coming into the club, my second objective was to try to improve my network for uh, business uh, and uh, personal connections. Uh, what I found was that uh, just uh, coming to lunch and enjoying the programs really didn't help with any connections. It was getting involved in club activities, committees, and hands-on service work. That's where we really get to know our fellow members and find out what good people they are and really enjoy their company and maybe perhaps develop some business connections. The third thing I want to say is about uh, Rotary and its worldwide influence. Uh, I uh, did not really feel too strongly about re uh, supporting the Rotary Fund. That's the fund for Rotary International when I was early in my membership. As I've come to learn more and more about Rotary International and uh, what it does and how the Rotary Fund operates, which is one of the most effective and efficient uh, charity organizations in the world. Charity Navigator rates it within the top 10 of all in the entire world. But the way that Rotary Fund works is that we have no barriers when we're trying to help in other countries. We have no geographical barriers, no religious barriers, no political barriers. We deal not through governments, not through religious organizations, but person to person, Rotarian to Rotarian. And that makes it more efficient, and we know exactly what's happening with our contributions. The other thing is that as an orthopedic surgeon, I couldn't be more happy about what Rotary International has done in the fight against polio. When we, this was started by Rotary in the mid-1980s, polio, terrible disease that cripples and kills, was endemic in over 130 countries in the world. 
Today, thanks to Rotary and then followed by the CDC and World Health Organization, we are now down to two countries. And the only reason that it exists still in those two countries is not because of any of the barriers that usually exist, but because of ignorance. And that ignorance is manifested as terrorism under the guise of religious fanaticism. So what Rotary has done against this dreadful disease is remarkable, and I'm very happy to support. So speaking of that, I have two checks here. One is for the Rotary Foundation, and the other is for the Rotary Club of Tucson Foundation for our scholarship endowment fund. Thank you. Uh, fellow Rotarians, we've been around, as many of you know, for coming up on 100 years. And thanks to our Centennial Committee, and for those of you out there watching, you may not know, we are a year away from 100th year as a Rotary Club. This is an exciting time for us, and with the effort of John Wong, Bob Schaff, and many others, we have gone back to our archives to remember some of our glorious Rotary past. And one of our most beloved members and a past president was Don Shropshire, former president and CEO of Tucson Medical Center. He was interviewed a number of years ago, and while the video might be a little bit old, the message he delivers is not. We certainly miss you, Don, and Rotarians, enjoy one of our past greats. I'm Don Shropshire. I served in 93, 94, and those were great, great times. And uh, fortunately, I was retired, but I found out I was working as hard at Rotary as I was at TMZ. And how things were done, you were in trouble. Mm -hmm. Now, we had Helen Milton. She was, she was a walking around filing cabinet. And uh, let me tell you, uh, the first year, I, I, that was the year, year I retired from, my, from the hospital. And then I had agreed to be Rotary, an advanced Rotary president. So then I decided I was going to spend my summers in Flagstaff at a home we have there. So that meant that, that, that I was away for part of that time, which was very difficult in the early part. And um, uh, I recall uh, that, um, that um, I, I would leave here, I would go to Flagstaff, I would fly to Tucson on Monday from Flagstaff. I would see t Helen Middleton most of Tuesday and other people to get ready for the Wednesday meeting that I get on plane go back to Flagstaff. <laughs> and I did that for, I don't know, several weeks. And, uh, but I c could not have done that except for the detail that Helen always had that was very helpful to me as president. And the other thing was the absolute willingness of people to do whatever they were asked. <laughs> what advice would you give a new Rotarian? I don't think a person should be a Rotarian if they are not absolutely passionate about service. I, I believe that Rotary, Rotary is built on the passion of individuals for their community and for the service and bettering of their community. So if they don't have that, they should not be a Rotarian. If they don't have that, they should not try to lead. Because you've got to, I think, inspire and show the value of that and the joy of that and feeling that we're not just going to eat and meet, but we're going there because collectively people can do things together. And one's got to also feel like that they could be a team player and not, a, not an individual star. Because Rotary is, the things that we do well are the things that we do as groups. And, and I think that that would be something that anybody coming into Rotary uh, should recognize and realize that you almost have to do what you're asked to do. Now, that's obviously one has to say occasionally to be practical, but it's amazing how one can find a way to respond if one wishes to and feels the commitment to do so. I think that's very important. And, uh, you know, leadership goes a long way. Uh, for example, you take Billy Joe Varney and you take uh, 
uh, people like that who, who've, who have gone on beyond our, our club and our district and, and national. Let me tell you, when I was president in 1993, I went to the Rotary International Convention in Melbourne, Australia. The convention was huge. It would seat about 10,000 people, and they usually had two, two sets of people. Well, I can, I, when I was there, Bob, uh, in, in that, that occasion, there were two special thrills there. One was the, the uh, there were 10,000 people in that hall, and in walked the collection of Rotary gr greats as they marched in with their flags and everything else. Guess who's in the middle of that line? Billy Joe Varney. There he was from Tucson, Arizona, and Melbourne, Australia. Uh, representing us and the rest, rest of, the, of the world. Uh, uh, Sue was there also helping him host events and things, a very thrilling thing. Another thing that happened there was the 500th millionth child was given a polio shot. 500 million. And here we are today about ready to close that out by the extra push to just get rid of it. And I thought that was a remarkable, remarkable experience. That has something to do then with the attitude you have when you come back and what you try to, to convey and inspire. You need those chances, but you need the kinds of, uh, of people like Billy Joe who are willing to go in advance and do things way beyond what most of us are willing to do. If you're accustomed to saying no, you never will get the full benefits of Rotary. You just won't. Because Rotary is, some, is a part of the bigger th theme of, of each other, of the community mm -hmm. and the world. So I do feel that that's an important frame of mind. I hope that when we're looking for members, that we will look for that trait, because I think that's the key to the success. I asked Rotary District Governor Ellie Patterson to say a few words to the club regarding the coronavirus and how it's affecting Rotary in this region. Ellie, first of all, happy birthday, but thanks for coming, and we appreciate all the work you've done this past year. Trying times for sure. Let us know what is the latest from your perspective. Please welcome our very own District Governor, Ellie Patterson. Thanks, Bob. And I will give just a quick update on the district and what we're doing with the threats of the coronavirus ongoing. So with the district update, we are canceling or postponing major events in the district and using Zoom heavily for committee meetings, trainings, and all other communications. AGs are in touch with their club presidents and members to find out just how they're doing. And I'm personally calling each club president just to check in and see how meetings are being conducted and seeing what they need from us because we are all on the same team. Remember, we're a 151, one district, 50 clubs, and one team. We're also encouraging clubs to reach out to their communities and how the clubs can help their communities in need, even though be exercising safety measures. But still, I know there's a lot of need out there and Rotarians are the perfect people to help that need and extend a hand. Now, I'd like to talk with my club members, my fellow club members, and wish you a happy belated, happy St. Patrick's Day with you all, and hoping that the luck of the Irish will shine on us soon as we continue battling the threats of the coronavirus. With a partial shutdown of the city and county and the ongoing need to be mindful of how to stay safe and how to keep others safe in these challenging times, we are in this temporary time of a new normal, and we're all in this together. Our club president, Bob Logan, is working very hard as our other club presidents in our district to make sure that he is meeting the needs and expectations of our members as best he can while also following the guidance and emergency orders that are dictating our daily routine and maintaining the social distancing prescribed. The most important thing right now, though, is to keep the communication and connection going by placing new meeting styles for our members so that we can continue the feel, to feel the camaraderie and fellowship that we have done with our normal meetings, even if it's virtual in today's world. Bob is doing a great job with that as testimony right here because we're being recorded, and you'll see that next Wednesday. After all, we are the Tucson Rotary family. We are strong and we are there for each other. We are also there for our community. 
There are activities or projects that we can help to keep our communities and friends supported and connected. Our acts of kindness will not go unnoticed. Oh, did I say acts of kindness? President Bob had engaged us in random acts of kindness last month, and it's more important than ever to continue those acts of kindness whenever you can. And here's just a few suggestions. Number one, a few of our members could come together virtually and in coordination reach out to those in need, especially our older members, offering to pick up essentials from the grocery store and deliver them, maybe pick up a prescription and deliver to them, things like that. Number two, take a look at your own social networks to see where people are seeking help. An early retired Rotarian from another local club sent out an email to not only his fellow Rotarians, but his neighbors and his friends, and telling them that he would offer to drive them to their appointments, that he would go shopping for them, and just do whatever they needed to have done during this time. Number three, start an email dialogue between members of things needed, such as member John has lots of toilet paper, Advil, and bleach, and maybe member Mary has extra fruits and vegetables. So encouraging members to ask what they need and simply reply all so that the members can stay home and yet feel that they will be getting what they need for their home. Number four, students at home Younger parents have to work because the students are home. And if they're not telecommuting, that makes it even more difficult. So consider a helping hand or just a simple voice of support. Healthy older youth might be available for sitting or taking children outside to provide a break while still practicing safe distancing. Young parents are stressed with work and family obligations confronting them. And we can help reduce that stress through our acts of kindness. They are not alone in this journey. Number five, community food banks are in great need right now, as are shelters. It's important to practice safe measures, but there are always ways to deliver supplies with minimal contact. You can leave at delivery doors or on the doorstep. Number six, buy five gift cards of local businesses so this, that this financial support will help them with the economic challenges those businesses are now facing. You can use them later or use them right now for pickup or delivery of food or items. I know there are so many more acts of kindness that you have thought of or will think of, and I appreciate you share, sharing them with me. So now in closing, I wanted to just share with you. I saw a post of Mr. Rogers, and it reminded me of what Rotary stands for, of what our club stands for. Mr. Rogers captured the moment. He said, When I was a boy and would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, Look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. Yes, that's what Mr. Rogers said, and that's what we do. The members of Tucson Rotary are the people who are helping. So let's keep helping. So stay safe and also keep washing those hands. We'll get through this together. Thank you. I have a pack mail store that does packing, crating, shipping, and like all of the people who are business owners was kind of wondering in my head, should I be open? Should I not? What should I do? And on Saturday, when I went to my store, we opened up at 10 and there was two people already waiting. And I could tell by looking at them, I didn't know them. I could tell by looking at them that they were really, really stressed out. And they came in and they told me the story that their daughter who lives in Ypsilanti, Michigan, has a five week old baby and called that very morning, Saturday morning, hysterical because she could not find enough baby formula for her new baby past Monday. So as grandparents do, they ran out, they went shopping, and they came in with enough baby formula to fit in a 20 by 20 by 20 cube box. So we packed it up to ship to, to um, this woman, and it was $200 just for the shipping. I didn't charge them anything because their story touched me too, but they paid $200 to ship baby formula so that their, baby, their grandbaby could eat after Monday. And my takeaway from that was that this is gonna cause all kinds of issues for all kinds of people. So I made the decision then and there that we were gonna stay open if people needed us. And sure enough, since then, just, just since Saturday, we've had seven different shipments that we've had to do emergency overnight of medications for people. We've shipped medical equipment, and there's all kinds of things going on that nobody knew that this was gonna happen. 
Uh, we've had some fun stuff too. We've had a couple of people come in and say, since I've been out of work for a couple of days, I'm working on projects, so I've wanted to ship this to my nephew for you know two years, so ship it now. So we have had some fun stuff happening, but for the most part, um, we're open and we're going to be here. And as long as the carriers, UPS, FedEx, and the post office are available, we're going to be here to pe help people get the things that they need and get them sent to the people they need. I'd like to congratulate you and, and Faye for this wonderful idea. Uh, hopefully, maybe it's something we can continue to do and uh, maybe quarterly uh, as part of our club activities. Uh, so when I received the, the envelope, the $10, I felt that it was something that I should add to and pass on to somebody. And the next day was at Safeway, um, and uh, I noticed a lady standing in the Starbucks line, and I attempted to uh, buy her coffee, but she uh, adamantly refused, even though I insisted a number of times. And uh, so a little disappointed, I continued shopping and was in the checkout line and uh, noticed the lady uh, behind me uh, with a, a young girl, her young daughter. And on the, the conveyor were six long stem roses, which is all, all that she had. So I said to the checkout clerk, I said, uh, uh, put those roses on my, on my bill here. And the lady looked at me in, in, in shock and said, wow, she said, that was, that's so kind of you. She said, these are for uh, my daughter's uh, kindergarten teachers that we're taking to them in, in, in appreciation today. And I said, well, I'm happy to do that, and I'm, I'm glad it's, it's for, for the teachers. And, and I said, all that I would hope is that, uh, that you would pass this forward to, to somebody else. And she said, oh, I certainly would, and thank you so much. And she was extremely appreciative. So it was... A, Really a re rewarding uh, uh, experience, and I was, I was really happy about it. I thought it would be a good time to show a, another Rotary inspiration. As you all know, as Rotarians, our mission for the past 20 or 30 years has been the eradication of polio in the world, which would be the second time a disease has been eradicated from the face of the earth. And one of the people that has supported that initiative is Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft and he has provided millions and millions of dollars towards this initiative. And we have a short one or two minute video from Bill to Rotarians worldwide. Enjoy. To Rotarians from around the world, thank you for inspiring us and helping make incredible progress against polio. So many of you have been part of fundraising and vaccination efforts and called on your leaders to stay vigilant against this virus. Because of that, we're now on the verge of eradicating a human disease for the second time in history. But the final steps to a polio-free world are the hardest, so we need your help to get there so no child will ever have to suffer from polio in the future. The Gates Foundation's long-standing partnership with Rotary has been vital to fighting polio. We need to keep that up. We're extending the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's two to one funding match with Rotary to help raise 150 million a year to protect children from polio. Together, we can make history. Together, we will end polio. Well, you're probably all wondering, what are we gonna do with March Madness? It'd be easy to call it April apathy, um, but we obviously are gonna suspend March Madness and our, our membership recruiting campaign until this whole thing turns around. So we're gonna continue on, but maybe it's gonna be in, in May or June. So just hang tight. We're gonna continue, we're gonna get a champion, and please continue to, uh, to invite uh, prospective members to these virtual meetings. So bring them to your computer, bring them to your home. Home hospitality is scheduled in April and I don't have an answer. I don't know where that's gonna go or whether we'll hold it. So just watch your email and we'll get back to you more on whether this is gonna be a going forward entity this year. Well, to finish off today, I wanna thank our guests and visiting Rotarians who may be sitting out there in the internet world Thank you to our fantastic program. Amanda Powers, CEO of FC Tucson. We appreciate you coming. 
And congrats to our birthday people, Dot Kret, Ellie Patterson, and John Wong. To our guests out there in the online world, if you liked what you saw today, please consider joining our club. We need people like you, especially at a time like today. If you have questions, feel free to contact the Rotary Club office and our executive director, Darina York. The phone number is 623-2281. So fellow Rotarians, we have a fantastic quote and it goes like this, it's so appropriate for today. Some people aren't shaking hands because of the coronavirus. I'm not shaking hands because everyone is out of toilet paper. You know what I mean? So fellow Rotarians, today, get your glass like we normally do at a meeting. Today we toast to patience. At this time, when there is so much fear and so many unknowns, we must be safe, be patient, and continue to hope for the best. We will get through this. Here, here. We are adjourned. We will see you next week. <laughs>